right, we are back. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up again for Jai Anti. All of me, why not take all of me? Can't you see? I'm no good without you. Take my lips, I want to lose them. Take my arms, I'll never use them. Your goodbye left me with eyes that cry. How can I go on, dear, without? Take all of me. Thank you, Jayanti. Let's keep the ball rolling. Uh, we have Destiny Watford and Greg Sautel. They're from Free Your Voice and United Workers in Baltimore. Y'all give it up. The land and the spaces that surround us are shaped by and are a reflection of the values of the societies we create. And our lives are shaped by the land that we occupy. My name's Destiny, and I'm from a place called Curtis Bay, a small community in South Baltimore that as recently as, two, as 2008 had the highest levels of toxic air emissions in the nation. When I walk through my neighborhood, what I hear are the constant sounds of truck barreling down the street. I see gray plumes billowing out of stacks, coals, coal being hauled into trains and piled into mountains ready to be shipped overseas. I see endless fleets of new imported cars parked in a massive lots ready to be circulated throughout the country. And then right across the street, I see people lining up outside churches to find a hot meal and kids playing in the park across the street from those mountains of coal. Parents at the local library filling out job applications online. I hear stories about people dying early from lung cancer and children trying to enjoy life while simultaneously suffering from asthma. I see and I hear the stories of high school students not knowing where they'll be sleeping from night to night. 
I see people facing eviction from homes that they're renting and that are literally falling apart and making them sick, but that they still can't afford. Wealth, power, and resources flow through my community every day, right alongside poverty, disease, and the overwhelming feeling that somehow we, my community, has been selected, has been designated, has been utilized as a dumping ground necessary to keep this operation of generating wealth possible. But all of this is a way of sacrificing a community, making it a dumping ground. It's not fate and it's not an accident. I started to realize this four years ago when my friends and I, then in high school, started to, to ask basic questions about human rights. We formed a group called Free Your Voice, part of United Workers, a human rights organization. And we started on a journey around this question, what does it mean right now to stand up for our basic human rights, for ourselves, for our family, for our community, for our planet, and for our future? Years of struggle have led us to win major victories against something that would have been another toxic development in the history of environmental and economic injustice. This development came in the form of the nation's largest trash burning incinerator, and it would have been scheduled to be built less than a mile away from my community if we didn't fight back. An incinerator that would have imported 4,000 tons of trash every day, all from outside Baltimore to be burned, that would have been releasing 240 pounds of mercury every year and 1,000 pounds of lead. But we rose up, and after four long years, we stopped it. The incinerator would have been a routine development in my community. The world wouldn't have missed a beat if we hadn't fought back. It, wouldn't ha it would have been celebrated as a green development by our officials, hailed as an economic plus and a jobs creator, making energy from trash a win-win. Burning trash is a renewable energy source by law in Maryland. Just like wind and solar, everyone can be happy. The structures, policies, incentives that have created the soil in my community grow rich for, are rich for growing developments like the incinerator. So what was our secret? How did we manage to defeat Goliath, this monster of a development? Truth is, it, there wasn't a silver bullet. No one held the key, but one lesson that I want everyone here to hear everyone here to hear, <laughs> uh, is that our power comes from humanizing one another in a world that so often dehumanizes us. And this is what I think of when I say that the key of organizing and leadership development, I got into this work because the people in the group that I'm a part of actually cared about what I thought listened to the concerns that I had and the questions and curiosities I had about the world. Not to extract my story for some bigger fight, but simply to build an actual relationship based on dignity and respect. <laughs> this strong bond, a belief that our lives are sacred, that we have ideas, that we are creative beings, is at the core of our fight. And our biggest victory was in that we created and continue to hold this space in a world that commodifies us in so many ways that views us as clients or customers or consumers or victims. Our first step was to build that feeling across the community. We took what we had learned and what we shared and what we knew about our neighbors and what we knew with our neighbors. We knocked on doors after doors and heard story after story of people suffering from lung cancer and respiratory disease and people dealing with asthma. And we honored these stories by making videos about Curtis Bay, about what we were proud of in the community, about what we thought needed to change. We gathered thousands of petitions from residents, months of work built up to this huge action in 2013 that we planned to march from our school to the incinerator site less than a mile away. It was pretty amazing. 
if we were all in like the bitter cold and we had organized residents, parents, students, and teachers and other supporters to march together, this was important for two reasons. The first, because it was the first time in a long time that there was an event like that in my community where people were unifying around an issue and demonstrating that in a big way. The second is that we got the media's attention and highlighted it as one of the biggest, and it turned out to be one of the biggest weaknesses of the incinerator, or highlighted the biggest weaknesses, the biggest weakness of the incinerator, which, that, which was that they were trying to build it less than a mile away from two public schools, thus evading state law by calling it a power plant instead of an incinerator. Yeah. After the march, we had great momentum and built on our strategy. We found that the incinerator was in contract to sell renewable energy to 22 public entities. Baltimore public, the Baltimore public city school system was one of them. We when we learned about this, we were pretty angry, but we also recognized that we found our leverage. We were a part of a public entity that was supporting the incinerator. We had a voice that mattered, and it wasn't okay that our public school system would be supporting a project that would harm us. We dug into those contracts and we found each and every entity that we could pull out without penalty, or we found out that every entity could pull out without penalty in the spring of 2015 if the incinerator failed to pr provide energy. So we rallied together parents and students from the schools across the city around the issue to stop the incinerator. And we used art, our, we used paintings and drawings and poems and songs to tell our story and to highlight their connection to the incinerator that they could, that they could stand up and help break the cycle of failed developments coming into our neighborhood. And that led to this moment that we had built up to bring to light the hidden connection of the Baltimore City Public School System and the incinerator in front of the school board. Our approach was simple. Being in alignment with the incinerator, with the incinerator violated the essence of school at its core. So we provided the school board with a choice to get out of their contracts and meet their values of the essence of public education. And the result is that this combination of public pressure with creating an opportunity for the schools to do the right thing worked to create a path towards divestment. We continued this pattern of uh, analyzing entities and contracts with the incinerator at their core and calling them to take action Entity after entity across the region, pressured by a growing number of supporters across the state, made the choice publicly to get out of their contracts with the incinerator. Even more, Baltimore City, which was previously a big fan of the project. This was huge, but the reality was that Energy Answers, the company building the incinerator, was still allowed to construct, despite the overwhelming public outcry. In fact, they were more motivated to push forward and defy the efforts to halt their project. They claimed that, they, that we were misinformed and misinforming the public and that our community actually loved the incinerator and embraced it wholeheartedly. With the help from an amazing ally, an attorney at the Environmental Integrity Project, we learned that the incinerator's permit to construct was on shaky ground because of delays that we helped to cause and the state agency responsible for the health and the safety of the environment in Maryland, known as MDE, could act and determine that the permits were expired, thus halting all construction. We reached out to MDE for months, starting with a simple letter saying that the legal facts about the incinerator's permit were being or the permits being expired due to lack of construction at the site. We waited six months for a response. And the response from MDE, whose job it is to protect the lives and the health of all mailenders, was silence. We responded with thousands of petitions and video testimonies from residents that restated the basic facts, along with the pleas for MDE to do their job and enforce the law. More silence. We then decided to give MDE a deadline from the public to a public agency. A small group of us delivered a written and verbal notice that we were giving MDE 30 days to enforce the law. The consequence of failing to meet this deadline, that was up to us.
wait, there's more. <laughs> Intensity was high. It was December of 2015, and Energy Answers was planning on construction in January 2016. It was the make it or break it moment in our campaign, and we realized that we needed to escalate. So we gathered together everyone who had stood with us in our campaign, who believed in our struggle and our demonstration, and in a demonstration of, a of hundreds of people, we all rallied outside of MDE with a simple plan to one by one hand in petitions to MDE with the most basic request, hey, do your job. <laughs> MDE, lock the gates. But we were prepared. Seven supporters sacrificed their freedoms engaging in civil disobedience. And after months of schedule of continued pressure, the MDE finally heard the community's and the city's residents call and demand for a sustainable future that determined the and determined that the incinerator's permits were invalid, immediately stopping all construction. We won. But let's be honest with ourselves. Sure, the incinerator was horrible, and its defeat is a step in the right direction, but it's just the beginning. Developments like and worse than the incinerator are being proposed across the country and across the world. We need a new vision of how to do development, and in Curtis Bay, we're working together to build that vision. In fact, the incinerator site was made up of 90 acres of land, and now the conversation is about what's next. Now that the incinerator is out, we have a seat at the table. But let's think about that for a second, because we went from a group of high school students, a collective working to stop the incinerator from the outside, but because of our efforts, the company promised that whatever, the company that we're in dialogue with, promised that whatever, that owns the land, um, promised that whatever development that happens will not be a smokestack, which is proof and a reflection of the power that we've built. This is big, but we need to work towards more than just the development, what the development won't be. And we need to work to find out what it should be. We're talking about real ways that we can create sustainable developments, like the, the amazing work that Eureka is doing. Thank you. Hey everybody, I always get the fun job of following destiny. Um, <laughs> my name's Greg Sautel, I'm in Baltimore. I'm a resident of Curtis Bay in the community that Destiny's from. And I wanna do a quick shout out to someone that, uh, whom without which none of this would be possible and that's uh, Destiny's mom, uh, Kimberly, who. <laughs> maybe stepped out, but. <laughs> so she came with us to, to Minneapolis. This is our first time being here. Um, and I wanna give another quick shout out to Mr. Harold McRae, uh, from Baltimore City Government, who actually journeyed in this morning. Who is, uh, who runs the City Farms Program in Baltimore City, and it's really significant to be joined uh, activists, residents, community leaders with folks from Baltimore City, because we're really trying to build on the amazing momentum from Free Your Voice, from United Workers, um, and make the development at this, not this, into something like this at the 90 acre site. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to share really briefly um, sort of what we're up to now. So Destiny referred to the values and the principles that guide our work um, in Baltimore, and we refer to that as fair development. Um, and the idea is that essentially we're being held hostage, hostage in our communities. In Baltimore City, with the issue of waste, we're between a rock and a hard place. We're on the ground. We have tens of thousands of vacant buildings and homes, um, vacant lots that essentially are used as large dumping grounds, large trash cans. And the reason that they're vacant comes back to a similar root cause as to why this incinerator development was, was facilitated. And that's the vision and the values that drive development. So vacant buildings and lots in Baltimore are allowed to stay vacant oftentimes because they're being speculated on, they're being gambled, that the future value of those sites, of that land that could be serving an essential function and an essential purpose for us as human beings to meet our basic needs, instead is being used as a vehicle to make profit. Um, for folks that aren't living in the community. 
Um, and so that leaves us with blighted communities. On the other hand, with solutions that are given to deal with the waste that we have that's piling up our neighborhoods, they're often sort of technocratic solutions or ideas that it's out of sight, out of mind. And that's not okay, particularly when the, the brunt, the, the, the burden is placed on the backs of low-income communities of color. And Brooklyn Curtis Bay um, is certainly that. It's a community that's been literally displaced over the years by environmental injustice. Literally three communities, Fairfield, Wagner's Point, and Hawkins Point, were all uprooted to make way for the city landfill um, and for polluting developments. So what we're working on is really a, a bottom-up, grassroots approach to development that puts values and human needs at the center um, and then works to rewire our city so that finances are actually flowing in to community-driven, genuinely democratic structures. In the case of Brooklyn Curtis Bay, we're developing a community land trust that's going to allow residents to actually control uh, land, own land as a community, to develop permanently affordable housing that stays affordable. Um, in terms of the 90-acre site we're working, we're not going to own the land because it's got some stuff underneath it that we don't want to own, and it needs to be remediated for a long, long time. So, but we are going to try to drive the vision and the values on that land, and so we're actually doing things like community solar, uh, which just passed in Maryland uh, more recently than here in, in, in Minnesota, but it's, it's something in Maryland now, and we're going to take advantage of it, along with composting, recycling, um, and other things that are directly taking on what this incinerator pretended to be a solution to. Um, but really, what I really want to leave you with, and this is my final word, is that these ideas and these, these values are, are crucial, but without us really taking seriously the issue of power and how we build it from the bottom up, these ideas are going to remain as ideas, and we're not going to be able to mobilize. And if anything resonates um, from, from what myself and Destiny are sharing, it's that, is that we really need to grapple with the issue of power um, in, a, in a real way and in, in form alliances that really cross communities, cross cities, cross the country, and really cross the world, because the challenges that we face are not simply local challenges, they're global challenges. Um, and so I'm really pleased to be here today and to engage with this network and with this community and hopefully bring this energy and this excitement back to our city. Um, thank you. Coming up next from Campus Kitchen, it's Allison Green. Hi, I'm Allison Green, the director of the Campus Kitchen at Augsburg College and chief sustainability officer. And it's not just me. I'm here too. My name is Marissa Benassuti. Um, I'm a senior at Augsburg College studying food and agriculture policy. And we're going to tell you a little bit about what we do, but hopefully have a lot of time to dream with you about ways we can change the system together. <laughs> So Campus Kitchen is part of a national network of nonprofits at over 50 different colleges and universities with the Campus Kitchen Project. And our mission is to use this program as a leadership development and community engagement tool so that we're bringing campus and community together and not just working on the food waste aspect, but building relationships and moving towards a new food system as well. The way we do this is working through four different um, issue areas, I guess. Um, food to know, food to share, food to grow, and food to buy. So food to know for us is really about being able to think more deeply about the work that we do every day and getting students and the community together um, to do that thinking. So we're able to host events, we do some nutrition education in the community, um, and so on. Food to share for us is our food recovery that we do. Um, which for us is really about building relationships. Um, it's less about showing up with a meal and saying, have a great day, see you later. Um, we sit down, students sit down with the community, we get to know our neighbors um, and share a meal together. Food to Know, Augsburg hosts a community garden on campus um, and we try to facilitate some knowledge sharing around growing your own food there. And Food to Buy, we host a small farmer's market on campus. Um, we accept SNAP and EBT at our farmer's market, and it's a small market, but there's potential for us there to make fresh, healthy food widely accessible to the community. And so that's the exciting part, is this little bubble. We do all these great things, and there's students and community members involved in eating together, but there's so much more potential in this system. So one of the things we would love to work more on is cultural sustainability. So. Uh, Augsburg is located in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood, very diverse neighborhood, and just this morning, Merce and I were out in the community garden with some East African elderly women 
uh, learning how to say cilantro in Swahili and digging <laughs> potatoes. And so how do, we, how do we get out of the way and make space to create a table together that allows people to bring all parts of them, all of who they are, to the table so that we can lift up and celebrate cultures together? And then food entrepreneurship. Sharing food is great, but uh, things like the tool library have made it easier to share, and the sharing economy is picking up, but we still need money. So how do we do things like create systems and opportunities to, the day before the first frost of the year, go and harvest those green tomatoes instead of composting them the day after the frost so that we can make salsa, chutney, cakes, whatever, and make some money out of it. And then working to go from social service to social change. So this is something we try to talk about with students a lot. Most of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis is that direct service, social service, bringing meals, eating together, stemming food waste. But we know that that's not the way that it should be. How do we get rid of those leftovers so that they don't exist? And how do we co-create a food system that the neighborhood wants, that the city wants, that the region wants, and globally? So working together so that it's not just social service, but acting on changing systems and creating a new one together. That's what we do, and we're really looking forward to being here with you to talk more about how to do that together and how to do it better. Thank you. All right, coming up next is Cliff Martin from Northfield Community Composting. Give it up. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna speed through stuff for the sake of time. Uh, I'm still like, like wriggling around in awe of the Baltimore folk and that amazing project, bringing together so many aspects of building power and organizing, but also building new systems that are equitable and sustainable for the environment. Amazing work, that's awesome. I everyone else is too, <laughs> I'm just thinking about that. So I'm from Northfield, Minnesota. That is south of the Twin Cities. It's named after a guy named North. It's not north of the cities. Uh, Northfield, Minnesota, it's a rural town, but it's also a college town. We have Carleton and St. Olaf College, two private liberal arts colleges. So we're not the same kind of like rural town that most of rural Minnesota is. And that makes a very unique opportunity for us being able to do curbside composting. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So uh, a little bit about me, I grew up um, living in the country, living in the woods, playing in the woods, also reading Ranger Rick comics, uh, the little raccoon you know, environmentalist who taught me to hate SUVs and stuff like that. Uh, but also with the, my, my dad in particular, who's, his parents grew up in the Great Depression, so they were very, you know, it was the, the reuse and uh, recycle, like there was not waste. That was a silly idea. And uh, he, he kind of did that. He didn't necessarily you know, teach me that, but I was around it all the time. In fact, just last night I was dropping off a load of popcorn. I'm also a sustainable farmer, like part-time. Um, I was dropping off a load of popcorn at my dad's house because I was gonna process some of it there. And uh, in this trailer, I had a whole bunch of wood scraps that uh, some other farmers were just gonna take to the dump. And my dad is like, wait, what are you doing with all that wood? I'm like, oh, we're just gonna throw it away. And he's like, are you kidding me? That's firewood and it's stuff I'm gonna make shelves out of. And we unload the entire trailer. And it was just another moment of, for the sake of time, because I couldn't, I couldn't deal with it, I would have just tossed that stuff. But there's my dad swooping in again, like, no, this, is, this can be reused. And that's, uh, that like ethic and that culture very much exists. And this is um, getting into some of this as has been mentioned, that very much exists in the working class. That's not just a like, upper middle class white liberal ethic about environmentalism. Working class people do care about the environment. They do care about reusing and recycling. Sometimes some education needs to be done, but that is very much there in the culture. So starting to talk about you know, how equitable solutions and solutions that aren't just accessible to middle class white people. And like, that's good, like middle class white people totally leading the way on being able to subscribe to composting in Northfield which is awesome. We have the task in front of us of how do we get make that accessible cost-wise to working class people. And that's something we aren't, you know, like we'll cross that when we get there. We need to launch this uh, program first. So I'm gonna get to telling you what that program is. Uh, a little bit more context, you know, we're dealing with climate change. Uh, we're starting to actually see the ramifications of climate change here in the United States. However, people of color in like island nations and many other developing nations have been feeling the impacts of climate change for decades now. Uh, we're starting to hit that a little bit harder here. Um, we're dealing with poverty and we're dealing with food waste. I think it's like a third of all food is wasted or something like that. I don't know the exact uh, statistic. And um, 
um, kind of in that context, I see us as in the, being in the United States, having a responsibility to change, to stop the systems that are doing that kind of waste, that kind of inequitable uh, economic situations, uh, destroying the environment, stop those systems, and also build new ones. But as we build them, we need to build them like Timothy is building solar gardens. We can't build them where uh, rich white dudes own them all the time. You know, if we just rebuild a composting uh, business that a rich white dude is the business owner of and he pays some you know, working class people of color to go pick up the compost at minimum wage, that has not changed very much. Uh, that's not the system we want to build. How do we democratize ownership into marginalized communities in particular? That's kind of the conditions and the why of this project in Northfield. So getting into what that looks like or how we go about that, there's a couple practices that we kind of keep in mind for that. Um, first one being uh, for myself, um, I do uh, sustainable farming with a really cool Oregon Northfield. That's really fun. It's a super good thing, food systems. I also do organizing with high school students around social and environmental justice. So like that was an awesome story. We're just getting that kind of stuff rolling here in the Twin Cities and a bit in Northfield. Um, and then the last thing I do is cooperative business development. And that's uh, this compost project falls into each of those in interesting ways on its own. Um, the, the practice we use, we kind of refer to as community wealth building. I really encourage you to kind of go online and type in community wealth building or communitywealth.org. It's a set of practices of how do we build a new economy that's actually centered on people and planet and in a way that isn't uh, just a facade of being green but is like genuinely environmentally sustainable and particularly democratically owned and controlled by the people who are usually at the bottom, marginalized communities in particular. Um, Finishing up more more or less uh, in rural economies, uh, we, we've had a bunch of great examples of the way that extractive energy and in ex waste systems in uh, urban centers they get plopped down in the working class neighborhoods, particularly in neighborhoods of color. Out in the country, they plop those down everywhere as well. But it's working class white people who you know they're more spread out because they're out in the country. They also aren't very organized. They also don't usually have a lot of legal power. They also don't have any money. Uh, that's the conditions we're working with. Part of the conditions we're working with uh, is that rural economies are very land-based. In that land, it's either going to be energy and usually extraction, like mining or even gravel mining, stuff like that, uh, a bit with energy, um, or, but food especially. So this is kind of the conditions in which we're operating. So in Northfield, bringing all this together for years now, we've been working on how do we start doing curbside compost collection in Northfield? We're a town of about 200,000. That's 5,500 households who get regular garbage and recycling pickup. Well, what we are building, and we finally kind of confirmed it with our trash carrier uh, just like last week, we've been working on this idea of doing this local business uh, that's going to do this, that's going to employ local people, but it's not just a local business. It's going to have the most green practices it can because we should do that. So, you know, we'll pick it up on bicycles and stuff like that. That's awesome. We should do that. However, it's going to be a worker-owned cooperative, and that's a really, really critical aspect of this work. And that's awesome. I'm glad people are familiar with that. That's awesome. This is a democratized workplace. Uh, there's a lot of ways that worker co-ops can come about, but this is that there is not a boss. There's not a singular one owner who then hires everyone else and gives them low wages, or, or that doesn't always have to be exactly like that. This is where the workers democratically own and control the business themselves. That can usually look like the workers of the business. They elect their own board of fellow workers, and those were, the board might hire a manager who is accountable back to the workers, not the other way around. Uh, and that's a really critical aspect of this. So that's, that's what we want to launch in Northfield. We, we've been working on all different aspects of that for year, like three or four years now. We finally got the go-ahead. We are going to launch this thing in spring of 2017, which is really exciting. That just got confirmed. Um, the workers in the worker co-op will come from a local, uh, work, like mostly working class youth of color jobs program that also operates in the schools. So that's where we'll be getting our workers from. They're really excited about it, like the program directors. Um, like a little quick thing on the worker co-op. A uh, couple other things. So in Northfield, we have a l wonderful history of small groups of citizens getting together to do tiny projects, such as we're going to help you build compost bins in your backyard. And like that's awesome. We should do that. That's good activism. However, what we really want to be targeting with this project is scale and impact, which means building power in particular, because we don't want to just have uh, th the point of this is not our individual choices. Right? That's, that's a big thing uh, that has been uh, powerful for me is that Cliff Martin recycling all of his stuff and composting all of his food scraps doesn't actually change everything. It's when Cliff Martin and a billion other people do. 
and us as individuals, 150 of us, 200 in this room doing that, it, that's a bit more scale, but we need this on the scale of thousands and millions and billions of people. Therefore, we can't just go around, I, or like we decided in Northfield, we don't just want to encourage people to go have a recycling bin in their backyard. We need to create infrastructure that makes it easy for regular people to start to develop different habits that reduce waste. That's really critical, and therefore we need a business. We need to eventually mandate from the city or from the state government that like you have to compost. Uh, but to do that and to get people to do that successfully, we have to do years, I mean literally years, like we're gonna do this for the next 10 or 15 years of door to door and tabling, just grassroots education. So here's what you compost, here's why you compost, here's what you compost, here's why you compost. We're gonna have to remind people of this for at least a decade based on kind of how recycling went in the United States on the 70s and 60s. So we're planning on doing all of that. Um, we hope this thing will hit the scale of about nine employees full time, uh, all paid uh, like up to $25 an hour, I think, so living wages. Uh, we have healthcare like worked into that. Uh, I haven't worked on the business plan a little bit, but we have a whole bunch of things built into the business plan before launching this. We have uh, exciting financing options that won't give, put us in debt to big private banks, but instead uh, we'll take a loan from a democratically owned uh, cooperative loan fund specifically, de um, specifically using its money to uh, produce more businesses like this, green, equitably owned by workers, things like that, which is really exciting. Um, we, we are really lucky in Northfield. We have a bunch of middle class white liberal people who care about the environment who are willing to pay for curbside composting. Uh, that's really good. Most rural cities don't have that. So if you're out working in a rural area and want to talk about you know, how to get this thing started, we have that advantage that's different from most rural towns, but I'm still love to talk to you about it. Um, I think I'll just throw out there one, two really good sources. One is Institute for Local Self-Reliance. If you're looking to do community scale, but also seriously scaled composting work, they have a really great report uh, called The Growing Local Fertility. We've based a lot of our research on that, and it's just like a, a bunch of case studies of composting projects across the country. The other one is communitywealth.org, or community-wealth.org, and it's all about these equitable models of uh, democratic ownership and control by workers and the community for projects like this. Um, I think I covered about everything. I'm probably over time, so thank you very much. And now we have Aaron Lavelle from Northern Spark. Give it up. <laughs> I'm last. <laughs> this is the grand finale right now. <laughs> <laughs> I am Erin Lavelle. I am an interdisciplinary artist. I mostly work in public art, and I'm also a producer. Um, fun fact that you can't find while Googling me is that I'm in grad school right now, and I'm in my final semester. I'm working on my portfolio, which is an artistic way of saying my thesis. And a big component of that portfolio is the ethics of art making. And that, of course, includes environmental ethics. So I'm here today to talk about the Northern Spark Festival. There it is. Um, the Northern Spark Festival is an annual public art festival. I've participated as a volunteer, as an artist, and for the last two years as a producer. And it happens, it begins when the sun goes down and ends when the sun comes up and it attracts up to 50,000 people over the course of that night. So it's really huge. Um, this past June, we made a commitment to the theme of climate change. And we asked artists to respond to that theme in their work. And we believe in the power of art as a tool for social and environmental change. And we've taken on this important topic but we had to ask ourselves, how do we then practically, not just conceptually, produce this festival in a way that responsibly supports our values? That's what it looks like. Um, one could argue that art, specifically temporary art that happens one night only in the context of a festival, is wasteful. And art uses materials. You need that physical stuff. It's critical to creating this expression of the theme. And the material choices matter aesthetically to artists. There are other artists in the room. And I know that the quality of material really matters in terms of what you're trying to convey. But we also have an ethical responsibility to those materials. 
And so as the producer, I decided to ask the artist to consider materials in a few ways when conceptualizing and then building their projects. First, I asked them to think about the source of their materials. Um, can you repurpose or reuse things? Can you use found objects instead of purchasing everything brand new? The second thing I asked is to think about the choices they had in the materials themselves. So can you select things that just won't end up in the trash? Are they recyclable? Are they reusable? Are they edible? In some cases, the answer was yes. <laughs> and then what is the future of this project? It's one, you're building this specifically for a one night festival, but are you able to mount this project elsewhere in the future? Are you able to use components, small pieces of this project in new ways in the future for your work? Or can you build your project in a way that when you disassemble it, different pieces from it are salvageable and can be reused in other ways? I had these conversations with the artists um, in a variety of contexts. I wanted to make sure that we embedded this messaging every single time we talked to the artists because this was a new request above and beyond what they had signed up for when they applied for the festival. So in every large group artist meeting, we brought this up and that was a great opportunity to um, have artists share with each other how uh, they were solving these problems. Um, we talked about it in site visits. So we would go to the site of the project and discuss while we're talking about how and where and how big, what is it made of? How are you making these choices? And then the final way we discussed it, which was quite impactful, is that they had to submit production specs, which had to be approved by the festival staff. And one of the questions in their production specs was, how are you responding to this question? And of course, artists then engaged in mostly email, but sometimes phone or in-person conversations um, on that topic. I know I have to wrap it up. I just want to show the three slides of three example projects really briefly. This is Wolf and Moose. It was made entirely out of salvaged, repurposed, and found materials. This is the illuminated reef, which they had repurposed materials from a previous project and created a brand new work. And this is the wishing well, which the sand and the pavers were um, actually given back to the original vendor and the artist worked out a deal where he would pay for these materials but wanted to make sure they got used in a future landscaping project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, everyone. We're going to do a little change in plan here because we're running short of time and we want to be respectful of everybody's time. And there are t um, three important people that I want to introduce you to that have something um, quick to share about some interesting uh, legislative actions happening and then following in the session in January. So we're going to skip open mic and questions, and we hope that everyone will stay for a happy hour and find the people that you want to talk to and connect um, in that time, if that's okay. So I'll start by asking Barb Jacobs, who is a legislative aide for Senator Marty and Frank Hornstein, to come on up. There's Barb. Sorry? Yeah, lights are good. That's great. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm State Representative Frank Hornstein. My, uh, the district that I represent is part of downtown and southwest Minneapolis. And uh, I, first of all, just really want to thank Eureka, thank the organizers. This has been an amazing day. Let's put our hands together. And our new co-president, who's amazing. Uh, and I, uh, there's so many important themes as we wrap up that I, w I wanted to focus on. Uh, but one is, and thanks to the people from Baltimore, welcome. Your inspiration is contagious. Um, they talked about power. And so much of what this issue is, is reclaiming our power, reclaiming our power to make change. Last night, we had Congressman John Lewis, 
icon of the civil rights movement who walked across that Edmund Pettus Bridge and risked his life for voting rights. And he talked about the fact that sometimes we have to make a little trouble to make a little progress. And I think that's what taking back power is all about. Because on this issue, the landfill companies, the incinerator companies, their allies, their lobbyists, all the big money that goes into this, we can beat them as, they, as, as was depicted in Baltimore. And as the Sierra Club here and MPERG here and NOC here proved, we can beat them here when Hennepin County wanted to expand that incinerator. So thank you to all those great organizers. So we have to look at this issue in terms of our power, our ability to organize, our ability to make change. And so one of the things I'm very excited about that Barb is gonna talk uh, a little more about as well is that we want to create in the Minnesota State Legislature uh, uh, an action, a movement, that we make uh, Minnesota a zero waste state. <laughs> and what are the policies and what are the actions that we need to take in the public arena as a state to make us a zero waste state? That is the kind of legislation we want to craft together with you. This is a partnership, and of course, you're going to hear from our great congressman in just a minute or two. He's doing something similar at the federal level. So we have to work at all levels of government, locally, state, nationally, to take back our power to build a zero-waste state and a zero-waste country. Thank you so much. I hope you will join us in that effort. And we have some specifics. Uh, Senator Marty is uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of our partners in this. Uh, Senator Marty and I uh, passed legislation in 2014. Uh, we beat back some big business pressure and lobbying to increase our recycling and composting goals uh, in our region and to make some mandates on business that they start doing a little bit more recycling. So we can have those victories. Senator Marty and I teamed up on that and we're gonna team up again. So I want to introduce uh, Barb uh, Jacobs, who works with Senator Marty. He took a tour of Eureka a couple of weeks ago, and he was so inspired by that that now he's going to put together some legislation, and we're going to work together with all of you on that. So Barb, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Let's continue to work together and to organize together for zero waste. Thank you so much. So I'm usually the person behind the scenes, not the one that talks. <laughs> um, but uh, my boss is Senator John Marty. He chairs the Environment and Energy Committee in the Minnesota Senate. And um, it was really fun to hear today people talk about BPA, microbeads, triclosan, community solar, flame retardants. Actually, that one didn't come up, but I'm adding that in because that's something we did recently. But formaldehyde, these are all things that we um, have worked to ban or um, curtail at the Minnesota legislature. So um, that only happens, though, when we hear from you. Um, policy um, happens, and if you're not at the table, it will happen to you. So we're really excited to be working with Eureka on uh, creating a, a, a bill that will outline what a zero waste Minnesota will look like. And I really hope that you guys pay attention and uh, we hear from you um, so we know how to do it right. So thank you so much. And we'll be committed to making sure we share opportunities to weigh in that will keep you posted on the progress and let you know about the hearings and make sure that we can all um, have our voices heard in, as we create this bill together. So finally, I want to introduce Representative Keith Ellison, who got off a plane and ran here so he could join us, and we're just so thrilled he's here. What an awesome, awesome day, man. You guys really have been driving this conversation you all are the leaders locally, Baltimore, Minnesota, other communities, Northfield. Who else is here, by the way? That's it? Chicago. Chicago. Come on now. Don't be shy. Audience participation. <laughs> who, who else is here? Chicago's here. Germany. Did you say Poland over there? 
Oakland, Oakland, <laughs> Oakland. You know, all these communities around our country really drive and change. And I just really love the part that I got to hear, you know, new organizational structures to have to democratize business and wealth formation. That, that's awesome. And, and you know, that great idea you had makes up for them boots that you're wearing, my brother. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and they, no, they really are fabulous. But, but the thing is, but the thing is, a lot of wonderful ideas around advocacy and driving the conversation. And I just want to tell you, and I say this, you know, with 17 days left in an election, you know, we, the law really is not set up in a way to help us facilitate what we need to do. You know, you know, Bernie Sanders and I had a bill called the End Polluter Welfare Act. And that's right. And you know what? We found that, we found that over, over $110 billion worth of subsidy is given to big coal, big oil, and big gas. Now, way less than that is given to, uh, to uh, solar and wind. And, and at, at this point, the federal government has no program that we've been able to find that actually promotes zero waste. So we've got to restructure what the law looks like. The law should benefit the people, not the big business. The law should benefit the many, not the money. You know what I mean? And so this is really part of our, our strategy. Some of you all will bring your scientific knowledge. Some of you will bring your advocacy. And others of you are going to have to bring your ability to come and change what the law is. And that's true at the state, the local, and the federal government. And so, Frank, hats off. Thank you for the work you guys are going to be doing. We introduced a couple of years ago a bill called the Zero Waste Development and Expansion Act. And we're pushing this piece of legislation because what we want to do is use the resources of the federal government to say to local communities everywhere, Baltimore included, everywhere, that we want to help subsidize your drive towards zero waste. Uh, at this point, you know, uh, we're, we're not doing that. But we really should be doing that. And we've gotten a lot of great sponsors for it. We want your organization to look at the piece of legislation. We think we're a long, long, long way from where we should be on this. But you got to start somewhere. And so let me just say to you guys that so much of what Frank said is absolutely right, but understand that voting in elections, while it may be some of the ugliest parts of power acquisition, it is part, and we need to keep that in mind too. Because if those guys who created the situation that we have now uh, can help, the law can facilitate what they're trying to do, we then have the ability to shift the law to make real, real what we are trying to do. And so let's join in on that front now, and I think we can do it if we really dig in and we really fight for it. So uh, thank you all for, uh, for doing this. Uh, Eureka, you are not only taking useful stuff and converting it into other useful stuff as opposed to burning it and burying it, you are driving the, the debate. You're driving the conversation. You're driving the discussion and in the, in the creativity of the people assembled here in this room today uh, is gonna lead to some places to where we never thought it would go. All because you brought us together and generated a critical conversation. So I'm committed for the long run. I know Frank is. Uh, let's keep doing it, you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, and for all your vision and work on all of this. And Frank, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to close it off. Um, well, I'm going to introduce the person that's going to close it off. But thank you again, everyone, for being here today. Um, thank you to all of the speakers. Um, thank you to Lynn and Therese and Megan and Chris, who really pulled all of this off. Um, <laughs> Um, we are really excited to keep having this conversation, and I um, will be in the coming days and weeks trying to keep that conversation going because it can't stop here. Um, and I really ask you to keep challenging us to make sure that we're bringing this conversation to more diverse communities. Um, we're trying to make it more accessible and bring more people in, but we have a long way to go in that. So please keep challenging us and telling us where we should show up and how we can show up. That's really important. Um, and keep asking us questions. 
Uh, as a zero waste social enterprise, we deal every day with how do we balance cost um, and our financial obligations with taking care of our people and moving our mission forward. And there are hard challenges that we deal with literally on a daily basis. And we wanna share and talk about those because it is possible to be an enterprise that balances all of those things, that thinks about profit, but also thinks about people in our community. And we, that is possible and we wanna talk about that and share that and get better at doing that with you guys. So with that, J. Anthony, can you uh, close this up for us? So let's continue to dream. And um, because we know that through creativity and dreaming, um, more can happen. I did forget to mention that there is a happy hour across the way at Lake Monster Brewing. Oh, right here, never mind. <laughs> Supported by Lake Monster Brewing. Yeah. And thank you, Sonny, so much for your emceeing. It was awesome. <laughs>